Okay, let's get started. So hopefully that was um, a little refreshing to get a different reading from sort of a different perspective, different style of voice. The Gold article is an article that I like uh, because of the way it sort of identifies what I think are a pretty exhaustive way that these, these causal loop diagrams can be used in complementary ways. So the idea is, you know, you start with a system like this one. Uh, and so this cartoon shows uh, a bunch of people all in high congestion, and they're all thinking the same thing. If these idiots would just take the bus, I could be home by now. And so each one of them had the option of taking the bus, and if everyone else would have taken the bus, then this option would have been a really great one. But because they all decided to take this option, because of the potential of it being so great, then it's a terrible option. So what, what um, archetype did they talk about in the paper that you would say you know, best captures this phenomena? One that you've probably heard about a lot in your other courses. Anybody? It was on, the, uh, it was on this assessment too. Yeah. The tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons, right? So this is, I think, most traditionally captured by the tragedy of the commons. And this is sort of a mental model for a bunch of other commons problems. And so if you take like SOS 325, uh, the economics of sustainability, you'll learn about more detailed definitions of what it means to be a, a commons and what the tragedy of the commons, what are the sort of the numerical elements that have to be there in the tragedy of the commons. But the structural elements are gonna be the same between my definition and the definition over there. And the same sort of system that is showing up here also shows up in things like deforestation, population growth, use of non-renewable resources, et cetera. And that is this archetype, where it's this basic idea that we have multiple entities, in this case shown as two, but you can imagine like each one of these loops, you could hang off you know, a thousand more of them, like on a big keychain, and each one of them locally would see that if they take the highway, and assuming that no one else is on the highway, then the highway will bring back gains to them, which will make them want to take the highway more and more. So you see the S here. Uh, just as a reminder, S is plus for you know, same and plus. So it's a positive link, and so this is a reinforcing loop, a positive loop. So both agents up here and down here see the same reinforcing loop for making use of this resource. And so locally, it looks like it's good to just keep taking the highway home. The downside is, every time you take the highway, you also increase the total activity on the highway. And that total activity, after some delay, is going to reduce the gains for every individual. Now, it's still going to be better to take the highway than to take you know, the bus, for example, at least up to a point. Uh, and so people are going to keep, this reinforcing loop is still going to keep people taking the highway. But every time more people reinforce and take the, you know, take the highway more and more, then the highway, uh, because of its limited capacity, ends up becoming a less attractive thing until eventually the highway is full and then nobody, everybody who doesn't take the highway, it, it's like a Yogi Berra thing, like nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. So it's like the highway becomes so crowded that everybody who didn't participate initially here starts taking the bus until eventually, you know, it's about equivalent for the, the time it takes to get home on the bus versus to get home on the highway. So that's sort of this example of the tragedy of a commons. It's a tragedy because everybody locally is doing what's best and everybody wants this to be a good option. But because everybody locally is doing what's best and the option is limited, then in the end, everyone ends up being their own demise. Is that the fact that this person can't get home on time is because this person is doing the exact same thing this person is doing. So if only you could control everybody else, then you could make effective use of the resource. But because you can't and everybody uses it, they end up reducing the resource to the point where the resource might as well be the alternative you had before you even had that resource. That's sort of the tragedy of that. And so the behavior over time that we typically associate with this ends up being an escalation in the activity of multiple parties in use. And as their activity gets used more and more, the gain coming back to each one of them decreases. 
until it hits sort of a point where nobody is interested in using the resource anymore. So you end up getting a, a every, a, 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 you basically get this thing here, where you get a congested group of people using all of the resource and nobody else uh, getting an opportunity to use the resource. And those who are using the resource aren't really getting a whole lot out of it better than other alternatives. So that's kind of the tragedy there. And if we identify where these tragedies happen, then what Kim and Landon say is they say, well, if you can find a tragedy of the commons, there are guidelines. And they say, you know, if you've identified this, then uh, maybe you shouldn't be looking for solutions at the individual level. Simply telling someone that they shouldn't take the highway is probably not going to solve the problem. Because for every person who doesn't take the highway, somebody who's taking the bus who wish they were taking the highway is going to take their spot. So you probably have to say, what are the incentives for all of the individuals to persist in their actions? And then think about, can you change the long-term um, collective loss so that it's made more real, so that you can internalize that? In economics, we talk about these being externalities. And how do we make it internal? So take the externalities and make them internal parts of people's decision making. And if it becomes internal parts of their decision making, then maybe they'll, this reinforcing loop won't be so strong. Or maybe it'll have a balancing part along well, with it. Find ways to reconcile the individual rewards with long-term consequences. Commonly, a governing body is chartered with the sustainability of this resource limit. So that's another thing. You can't control other people from coming in. But maybe a governing body can. Maybe they can say, oh, you know, only allowing 100 people on the road at a time. The next person wants to get on the road, they have to wait for somebody to get off. And so that is one way to solve these problems. That isn't necessarily the only way. So Lynn Ostrom, uh, so very famous uh, sort of social scientist who had a role here at ASU, um, her big shtick was that there are ways to kind of, to, for decentralized ways, for local communities to solve these problems without needing sort of a militant governing force to come in and say, no, you can't use this and you can. So, uh, but these are general guidelines. So this is when you notice a tragedy of the commons, your first thought should be along these lines of these bullets. So that's one way we can use those tragedy of the commons. And notice that I talked about behavior over time, I made predictions, I tried to explain what was going on, I gave us prescriptions for what we should do. I used this view of the system in a number of different ways. And that's what Kim and Lannan were trying to say in their paper, is that these causal loop diagrams, or these, I would say, these archetypes, are meant to be used in multiple ways to give us a handle on these complicated problems. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, these sort of four uh, different ways of looking at the system. Lenses, structural pattern templates, dynamic theories, and tools for predicting behavior. And so, like, if we just start with structural pattern templates, this is one of those answers on that assessment. Structural pattern templates allow us to look at it, an ugly diagram like this one, where you can't even read the, the variables. But it doesn't really matter about the variables, because when you zoom out, you end up seeing that actually what's interesting are the way in which these loops are positioned around each other. So structural pattern templates allow us to go from a single variable to a single loop to a pattern of loops. And, uh, and that can be useful when making sense of these things. Like for example, if I draw my causal loop diagram and I see two balancing loops next to each other, then I know that from here, there's actually two different ones where balancing loops are next to each other, and I have to evaluate which one of these it might be. And so there's one in here, drifting goals. Two balancing loops strive to close the gap between a goal and current reality. That's part two on the assignment due Sunday, is to come up with your own example of drifting uh, goals. And if you can see that there's two balancing loops, one that's trying to meet a goal and the other one that tends to change the goal, uh, then those two things together tell you that although you might have started out with high performance aspirations, over time, you might end up uh, actually coming, decreasing your, your expectations on performance and your performance will end up suffering because of it. 
So seeing this pattern, two balancing loops next to each other, one that's adjusting the goal and one that's adjusting the performance, is a red flag that maybe we need to make an intervention here. So I don't actually have to care about what's in the, the actual variables here or even how these links work. If I just back up and see these two things next to each other, it allows me to make sense of the system without having to worry about all the, in, the tiny details of the context. And I, my claim is there's a lot of uh, systems where this drifting goal shows up. And my hope is that as you submit things on Sunday, we'll see a diversity of different answers for that. So um, there are questions about this idea of what I mean by going from uh, links to loops to patterns of loops, or even questions about uh, you know, drifting goals, because I know that we have to work on drifting goals. And we'll talk more about drifting goals a little later in the lecture when we talk about different contexts. Good question. So in the, la in, a, in the last part of the assignment due Sunday, I ask you to draw, I think, three feedback loops that are coupled together. One example could be this, like, a growth and underinvestment. Um, uh, tragedy of the commons is fine. There's four loops there. So yeah, any ones of these where you can see three or more loops shifting the burden, those would all be fine. Or your own. They don't have to come from this list. These are just common ones that show up so that if we notice them, then they may be, for example, red flags that we need to look into more detail. So that's structural pattern templates. You know, the base idea, identify known structures. Now there's the other way of doing it, and I could think of the copy center dilemma, where we view these structural pattern, or we view these archetypes as lenses. So they are, helps us identify the right questions to ask. So if I think about the copy center dilemma, there's a bunch of different ways I can model kind of what is going on in this copy center. And there were two of them that were, came up in the article, but there might be more. So we could view each one of these archetypes as like a different lens. And maybe it has a slightly different color filter on it. Uh, so it brings out different parts of the picture. So with one of these lenses, uh, then I might look at this copy center and I see a tragedy of the commons. And so in that tragedy of commons, so what, what is the, so yeah, tell me the story of this tragedy of the commons here. So what is the activity that we're talking about? Do we remember from their narrative? We have a, a big, uh, we have an office with a copy center that's a central copy center and people need copies to be made. Two different groups, let's say, need copies to be made. So what, uh, so what would we say is this activity in that copy center dilemma, and what made it a tragedy of the commons? There's an increase in the workload uh, through different departments. So there's the, the, the departments are using the copier more, so that tells us that there's some resource limit. The copier is, is limited by the amount of copies it can put out per day, per hour, whatever your time unit is. Um, but so then what is the activity here? So everybody's got to make copies. And so um, what did we view as the kind of this, you know, if we think of the road system, what was the, 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 the everybody's going to the highway. What did everybody start doing that ended up making that activity end up being worthless? Urgent prioritizing. The prioritizing. So in the copier example, you sent a job to the copier, and it would kind of take a while. And so that's kind of like taking the bus. It takes a while to get home. So instead, you say, no, this is a priority request. This is the highway. I need to get home a little faster. So I am not going to take the bus. I'm going to take the highway. And then stamp this with a red mark. This is priority. And so, and initially, it, the job gets put to the top of the, the, the queue, and, uh, and then it gets done quicker. Just like getting home on a highway takes quicker than maybe taking the bus. So this right here is one group in the building starts sending these priority requests. But as they do that, and they eventually all of their jobs become priority requests. And so now it's hard for your priority request to really come to the top of the queue because there's all the other priority requests that you have to fight with. And so the gain per the individual activity goes down. And this is happening all over the building. So simply giving people these priority requests it is going to end up leading you to a point where everybody marks their jobs as priority. Because why would you not? 
So the individual incentive is always going to favor sending a priority request. The individual incentive is always going to favor, if you have a super fast highway with tons of capacity and you want people to maybe use public transit or their, their cars, and let's say it's cheap to drive cars, the individual incentive is always gonna be to take that cheap car to the cheap highway and get home faster. So it's the same problem here. So then we have to ask, you know, what did we do wrong? You know, maybe we, uh, we have to limit the number of priority requests that uh, can come out of a department. Maybe that's one way to solve this sort of thing. Maybe we need somebody to approve the priority request and say, yeah, that actually is priority, or I don't really think this is priority, like a governing body. So once we've recognized the tragedy of the commons, then we can use these guidelines to suggest to management what they might be able to do to relieve this problem so that the workload on the copier goes down and people um, start uh, maybe making more honest use of the resource. But there's another way we can view this system. And so we can shift things over and look through a different lens. It's like a different color filter. And when we look through this lens, we don't see a tragedy of the commons, even though it might be there, we're just not focusing on it. What we see now is shifting the burden. And so the shifting the burden archetype is that we've got a problem <laughs> system, and it is, uh, there's a quick and easy solution that, you know, that solves the symptoms, but there's a more fundamental solution. And the more people use the quick and easy solution, it actually reduces the uh, amount of the fundamental solution that actually should be being used. So this, uh, so in this, in, in the behavior over time, tends up being that your problem symptoms initially go down, but then they come up and then they end up growing over time. Meanwhile, the fundamental solution that probably we all should be doing is going to zero, whereas the symptomatic solution that we shouldn't be doing is going up. From this perspective, and this was, we talked about this on the assessment here, how do we look through this lens and see the copy center? What, what is the um, problem symptom and let's say the symptomatic solution in the copy center example? Somebody on this side of the What, this is simple to say, what is the symptomatic solution? So I'll give you, if the problem symptom is that copies are taking a long time to get made, what is the symptomatic solution, the kind of short-term solution? Yes. Uh, the prioritizing. prioritizing, exactly. So symptom, slow copies. Symptomatic solution, prioritize that copy. So I do that, uh, if I get slow copies, I'll get more priority copies, and the copies will stop being slow. Problem solved, right? That is the initial, the initial problem is the problem isn't solved because there's a fundamental solution. What is an example of a more fundamental solution to this problem? Yeah. Getting another copy center. Getting, that's, yeah, that, right, maybe we're just overworked. We need another copy center. We need, more, we need more investment in copy centers in this building. But the problem is if you say, well, we'll just let them prioritize things in the short term, and in the short term, it makes it look like the problem's not as bad. The manager's gonna say, oh, all this money that we had earmarked for buying a new copier, turns out we maybe don't need it, and we're gonna invest in something else. And so they end up pushing that money into something else, but then over time, the problem gets worse because the symptomatic solution ends up not being that helpful in the long run. So another fundamental solution, does anybody else have another fundamental solution that uh, you know, might be used instead of investing in copies? Or in more, or more copy resources? Higher uh, higher Well, we already have somebody today. That's the kind of the, so we do have a, somebody who's just making copies here, but it's how are they choosing whose copies to make is the problem. And so we could hire someone else to make copies, and that's sort of doubling our resources. Is there another fundamental solution other than those two that isn't about increasing the number of resources? What else might you do if you notice a lot of people are just prioritizing copies? So you take a look at their priority requests and it's like their calendars for movies or something like that. They're not really related. 
Yeah, you could encourage not making copies, exactly. You could put other alternatives. So a fundamental solution is maybe we're too paper-based. How do we make things more electronic? And if we made things, made people encouraged to do the electronic, then maybe then they wouldn't need as many copies here. So that would be another fundamental solution. But so long as we just allow them to prioritize their copies, then they're not going to take the electronic route because they might be, I think I heard someone say they might be old, you know, they might just really need their paper-based stuff. And so, um, and so you get this side effect. So that is, a, you know, these are not, neither one of these is wrong, but these are two different ways that I can look at this problem, shifting the burden and tragedy of the commons, and they have slightly different guidelines here. So like, if the side effect has become the problem, you may be dealing with an addiction structure. You can become addicted to your priority requests. And we know that addictions are hard to break. You know? So uh, whether a solution is symptomatic or fundamental often depends on your perspective. Explore from different perspectives and try to come up with a comprehensive understanding of what the fundamental solution is. So um, maybe you're not sure which one is which. And so it, it, it guides you to sort of say, can we find another solution that might be more fundamental? So provides us new perspective in thinking about these systems. So that's what we mean by lenses. We take the causal loop diagrams as explanatory figures to really say what could be going on here. And I can try on a bunch of these different things. Some of them aren't going to fit. Like success to the successful, it's another archetype that really doesn't make sense here. And so it's not going to help me with this. But both of these seem to fit. And so I can then ask questions that come from both of these different perspectives. The same way, if I look through them through green colored glasses, I stop seeing the greens and I start seeing other things and it gives me new perspective. If I look at them through orange colored glasses, I start seeing, or stop seeing the orange, but maybe it brings out the greens. And, uh, and so in that case, uh, it gives me a totally different perspective. But both perspectives are valid, but they might be hidden if you don't put on the lenses first. So that's what we mean by lenses. So are there questions about that basic idea? Causal loop diagram archetypes as lenses. What we mean by lenses. I just want to make sure that we're, we're sort of building up a conceptual model for what I mean by pattern templates, where we just look for these things, and they might be red flags. <coughs> lenses, where we don't necessarily look for them ahead of time, but we then ask, um, how can I think of this as a tragedy of the commons? And if it fits, then how, what does that tell me about the system? So are there questions about either of those two that we've covered so far? Okay. All right, so then we get, what I think is now we're getting into more exciting. Um, so dynamic theories. So whenever we hear the word theory, a theory generally is something that answers a question of why. So, um, so I said a model answers a question of what if. So usually we test theories by using models. So why does this happen? You answer with a hypothesis. Um, so you can hardly see it here, but some other class today was suggesting that uh, there's a hypothesis that gender and wage are related, whereas the alternative is gender and wage are not related. So that is an answer to a question. Why? Why do we see a particular thing in society? Well, it's because gender and wage are related. That's our hypothesis. But in order for us to test that hypothesis, we have to come up with a prediction. A prediction being, well, if they were related, I would see these, these things in the data. And then I can build a model. Maybe that's a statistical model of, uh, of, you know, from data that I've gathered. Maybe it's a simulation model. And I test that model. And that model is that what if, because it helps me answer that if part. But up at the very top of that, the theory, how do you even come up with these theories to begin with? And we can use the causal loop diagrams, the archetypes, to help answer that why question, the theory question. The idea here is that if we think about systems like this one, uh, from assignment B2, why does a newer, better system go totally unnoticed? Betamax was a better system than VHS for VCR. Uh, just take my word for it. But um, there was already kind of a stronghold for VHS, and it was too hard for beta to break in. I have just said to you a theory that I may have had a hard time coming up with at the time. But that theory is consistent with this success to the successful template. And that basically says 
th this is, you know, the, this is basically, this is from Kim and Lannon, this is from that other reference, that Ford textbook, and, but they share pretty much the exact same structure. I have allocation to A instead of B, that's the fraction of sales uh, to VCR, or to VHS instead of Betamax, and I see that there is one reinforcing loop next to the other one, and what this tells me is that once, if, you, if one loop gets started before the other one, it's gonna be hard or impossible for the other one to ever actually take hold. So even though we, in principle, have a reinforcing loop. So the reinforcing loop here, that's the marketing guys. They come out and they say, oh, Betamax is so much better than VCR, or than VHS, and so it's gonna take off because it's better. The better is them saying that there could be a reinforcing loop here. But the downside is, is that the, you already have other processes in play that regardless of how good this solution is, you're just never gonna break the inertia of this solution. So we have to sort of say, well, okay, um, you know, we can see other systems where this is like this. So in the Kim and Lannon paper, they said we have an, uh, an existing email client that has problems from a management perspective. We want to have them use a new email client. ASU, especially at the faculty level, is terrible about this. We go, we got Google on one side and Microsoft on the other, and uh, people's personal on the other side. So there's basically like three different systems. Nobody can agree on them, and all the staff who were only trained on one assume that all the faculty and students use that one. For a while, students didn't even have access to the Microsoft side of things, so you'd schedule with faculty, but you couldn't schedule with your students in the same system. It was terrible. But management, as most management in ours, you know, very short-sighted, because that's just the role of management, is to be short-sighted. And they would say, okay, we want you to use this email client, so do it. But of course, nobody did. And so the question is, why? Were, did, does everybody stick with this one here? Well, because they were already using it. It's really costly to go over to this one. And so we see this success to the successful, regardless of how good this is, this is already the successful one. Beforehand, you know, a priori, we just were gonna take it, it is successful. And so in order for us to break it, we need to give people reasons to break it. And so this was another one of those answers here. We either need to implement something that makes the usefulness of the existing email give us more actually utility of the new email, or the use of existing email give us utility for the usefulness of the new email. In other words, we need to make it so that if you liked the old email system, we're gonna give you even more incentive for the new one. Yes, right, I hate Candid. I can't stand Candid. And that's because of the richness of expression. I can do so much more in Blackboard. However, from my understanding, from the student perspective, the, it is easier for you to fall into a class that has an easier to manage Canvas side from the student perspective than a Blackboard side. And um, at least that's what I've heard. And, uh, and so, but that was another thing where they just, the way they implemented this, is they just got rid of that. They, they get just, you know, they stopped subscribing to Blackboard. We all had to shift to Canvas. Or just to not, you know, stop using learning management systems entirely, just post it on our own personal web pages and things. But if these were both coexisting, I guarantee you that most of your professors would still use Blackboard. Like, why bother with shifting to Canvas? Especially given that from a faculty side of things, there's even less that I can do with Canvas than I could have done with Blackboard. So why would I go over to this? And so they forced us to go over to this, and maybe that was a good solution or not, I don't know. Um, I've had long, you, you sort of hit a nerve. Um, so maybe I should stop. But, the, um, but, but that is an excellent model of exactly this, and the way in which this happened was them by making it impossible to use the old system. So we just had to go to the new system. But in reality, if you don't have that level of control, then you might need to implement something else. Like, we're gonna make it easy to import your email. We're gonna, we're gonna add a feature that you've always wanted in this email client, but now um, you can get it over here, and though you've never had it there. Um, we might, uh, I used to have a piece of software that um, it had a security flaw in it, and in order to get 
in, in version 3.9 of the software, there's a security bug that they fixed in 3.95. But to upgrade to 3.95, you lost a critical feature that you could get through the paid upgrade to 4.0. So they took advantage of people saying, we know that you need this security feature, so you either lose something you want to patch the bug or pay us and you get both. So I thought it was ingenious. Um, at the time, I was not so impressed. So, um, it, it, so that you know, is a way of implementing these edges over here. Because if you don't have these loops, these balancing loops, then you're never going to kill this reinforcing loop. So that's an example of a theory as to why people ne don't use your new system and keep using the old system, because you've not provided them these loops. All right. So there are questions about that, this idea of using causal loop diagrams to build dynamic theories of why things are happening. Okay. All right, so the last one, um, instead of asking why things are happening, we can ask what will happen. So this is also goes along with this, and so tools for predicting behavior. So I've used this term before, the endogenous perspective. Uh, this is a perspective that future behavior is primarily determined by the internal structure of the system. We could also say that anything interesting that happens in the future that's different from what goes on now is going to be caused by something arising from outside that we have not anticipated. And that's fine, and there are different ways to model that. But uh, we, it's also interesting to ask, what could happen even without that? And can we assume that the way things are going now are going to keep going that way? And so this reinforcing loop, new products give us new customer orders, give us new revenues, give us new development of products, give us new products again. And so that is a reinforcing loop that suggests that our revenue is just gonna keep growing, the products we build are gonna keep growing, everything's just gonna be fine. And so we would predict the forecast that growth today means growth tomorrow. But we know that that's probably not realistic. Realistically, there's probably a balancing loop on there. And in this particular balancing loop, as you get more orders, you get more organizational complexity. As things get more difficult to manage internally, you get a burden on your product developers. And that burden on the product developers is going to prevent new products. Funny that you mentioned Canvas. This is a pretty good example of that. Canvas was a platform that was introduced for small scale high school operations. And it worked okay. It was, you know, you know, it was good enough for that. And they can make the student front end pretty decent and it's sort of manageable. And then they had a rapid expansion. And now it's impossible to get a feature implemented on Canvas. There's so many bugs on Canvas. Uh, as an example, when you guys do your final presentations in groups, you're going to upload them as Canvas. So I'm going to have you do peer review. I would have liked to have each one of you review at least two groups. But instead, each one of you is only going to uh, do one group. Now why? That's because in Canvas, if I say that you um, have to review two groups at random, it randomizes at the individual level. And so the two groups that it gives you may actually be the same group, but just from two different members of the same group. And there's no way that I can fix that in Canvas. And regardless of how many people have complained about that, I can guarantee it will never get fixed. Because in all of Canvas's internal development has shifted over onto sales. So all of Canvas's development, they don't have, I have like one or two people, it seems like, who are actually doing any software development and fixing minor bugs, and everybody else is just selling the product and managing this organizational complexity. So there might have been this initial rise and this is a very promising learning management system, but it is now falling off. And, um, and so and you could argue the same thing with Blackboard. Blackboard was very ugly behind the scenes. It took a lot of training of faculty in order to use it and a lot of training of students to be able to find everything. You could do a lot of that stuff and they could have improved the front end, but it stagnated. So stagnation, that's just normal, that's life. Things drift towards stagnation, fixation, that just happens. We cannot count on optimization in real life systems. And this is the reason why, because there's these balancing loops that will always kill your growth. 
And so if you want to keep your growth as long as possible, you need to think ahead of time about what's going on here or prepare for that. So that's what we mean by tools for predicting behavior. Looking at the internals of the system and ask, what are all of the things that could happen with the system? And have we accounted for all of those when we're doing our planning? So, um, and that's, this is just sort of, this is my canvas plot. So the initial rise of canvas and its popularity, and then the adoption by universities and the now plummet to less than blackboard level quality, I think. So, any questions about that? This idea of dynamic theories, one for understanding what's going on, one for trying to predict what will happen. Four different ways to look at these things. Now, what can be confusing is that there's a reinforcing loop and a balancing loop next to each other, it limits to success. But there's also a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop in fixes that fail. And these are very different. Limits to success describes performance that rises and then levels off or falls. But fixes that fail describes these problem symptoms that uh, may have a short term fall but then ultimately rise over time. And so then the question is, well, if, I, if it's all about the loops, I have a balancing loop next to a reinforcing loop in both, what's the difference here? And that's what you have to be careful about, is that in limits to success, we see that there is a growth of performance that's ultimately limited, because with increasing performance, you end up bumping up into limits on the system. Whereas over here, you've, uh, the, 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 here it's like the first thing was the reinforcing loop, and then as you reinforced the system, this other part of the system showed itself, and this is kind of the secondary thing. Over here, the balancing loop is actually the first thing that happens. So you have a symptom of a problem, you try to fix it, but that fix ends up after some delay creating more problems later. And so which one's kind of first is what determines the difference between these. So it isn't all just about looking for loops, but looking for loops is the start, and then you have to ask myself, which context am I in? Am I in the, the one where growth comes first or where balancing comes first? Am I in a problem-solving prob uh, scenario or am I in a growth scenario? And then it was also a simple thing, so this is just me saying all of that, and then we've also seen this with escalation. So we opened up this example down here in one of the early lectures about the, the uh, heating and, uh, uh, system at home. And we said that looks like this so-called escalation loop. And in the escalation loop, then you have, and I can zoom in on that, you have an activity on one side and an activity on the other side. Both of them are trying to balance something, but, and they end up regulating some in between quantity, like the temperature of the home. But the temperature of the home is never quite what you want it to be, and it's always different than the outside. So the outside is always sucking heat out, and you're always trying to pump heat in. So even though the temperature of home stays level at one particular point, it's constantly requiring energy to be pulled in here and dumping energy out over here. And so that's what we call an escalation loop, uh, because um, it has this kind of bow tie shape and because there's one variable, we can kind of think of this balancing loop as having a figure eight effect, where the, the odd number of, minor, or of uh, negative links here add to the odd number of negative links here, so that when you go around the loop twice, you get an even number of negative links, and the two balancing loops turn into one big reinforcing loop. So that's the way we reason about escalation. But in question two of that assignment due on Sunday, I ask you to implement drifting goals. Drifting goals look similar to balancing loops, but if you think about it, I now I have two variables that can move independent from each other, not just one. So I have a goal that I have made a separate state variable that can move independently from the actual over here. And so because of that, the actual is being brought up to meet the goal, but up top, the goal is being brought down to meet the actual. And so instead of getting growth over time, like I get an escalation, because I've got these two independent systems that interact with each other, then the behavior over time is the goal gets smaller and the gap never quite moves or even um, the, you know, maybe it actually 
uh, the actual ends up um, being far less than the original target here. So there's a, even though the two loops are next to each other, I recognize that in the previous case, there was a single variable that linked them. In this case, there are two separate variables that interact through this, uh, this process here. And so it does take a little bit of squinting to tell the difference between the two of these, but it's at least a good first start if you at least just notice that you have two balancing loops next to each other. So that's the big difference between escalation and drifting goals. So there are questions about that. Is it clear the two different types of systems? But I would not call the heating system a drifting goals system because um, there's only one variable. Yeah. Uh, the way you describe it is like the escalation loop kind of feeds into itself like a equation or something. Yeah. Why is it that not the case with that? Excellent. Good question. And that's, that is because in the, in the infinity one, there's only one dynamical variable, let's say temperature in the house. And because there's that one dynamical variable and there's two feedback loops acting on it, then those two feedback loops have a way to kind of add. But in this case, I've got two independent var uh, variables. I've got the goal and the actual. And because they're two independent variables, then I can only really think about the loop and how it's acting on this variable and the loop and acting on this variable. When we get the stock and flow diagrams next week, this might become clearer. The downside of causal loop diagrams is it doesn't differentiate between what I would call a stock, like a variable like this, and a flow, which might be the corrective action. But basically, the, if we're jumping ahead to that, in the escalation behavior, I have one stock, and then I have multiple loops adjusting its flow. In this case, I have two stocks and two separate flows, and that's why they don't couple the same way. Good question. Sir, you have some question? Yeah. Um, why would you say that the flow is even an example of drifting goals and not the actual drifting goals? Like, if you didn't want it, I, I'm going to say that's a. Uh, well, I would say that uh, drifting goals are positive. That's an excellent question. So, when could drifting goals be positive? Does anybody have an idea of when drifting goals can be positive? I say it's not usually portrayed that way, but I think we could model a positive situation with drifting goals. What about, um, you know, so let's say you start wearing a, a, a fitness band or something like that, and it tells you at the end of the day, oh, good job, you hit 5,000 steps. And you say, oh, I had no idea. On a normal day, I hit 5,000 steps. What might you do the next day, now that you're realizing that it's counting your steps and that you hit 5,000 steps the previous day? Might you stay at 5,000 steps or might you be driven to do something else? Yeah. You might, yeah, you might say, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll try to go for 5,500 steps today. And so I would say that we probably could model in the same sort of way here where, it, it, you know, I, I haven't done all the math in my head, but I, I have a feeling that we could actually uh, set up a system where if we think about the gap as being, um, so normally we're, ma we're modeling these gaps as being negative and you're trying to move up to the gap. But if we, if we think of these gaps as positive, uh, if we sort of flip the polarity of how we're measuring the gap, then it's my guess that you can have a goal like my step target and if you continue to meet that goal or exceed it, you will then raise that goal. So normally we model this as I'm not hitting my step target. So over time, uh, so I'm kind of giving away a possible answer here um, for that number two, uh, but the, over time I reduce my step target and that's the way that I meet my target. I don't actually walk anymore, I just am okay with walking less. But on the other hand, if I exceed my step target, then maybe I increase my step target. And then if I exceed that, maybe I keep increasing it. So that would I think would be a way of having sort of a, a virtuous uh, drifting goals as opposed to a vicious drifting goals. All right, any other thoughts about that or questions about that? If you didn't, if you're gonna use the step target and it's not, it's sort of like, think about a stair target, something that's just Yeah, th this is the standard, and this is the process of raising or lowering the standard. This is the actual performance, and this is the your 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 
how you move the performance around, and the gap is the difference between the standard and what you're actually doing. Yeah, so if you actually walk more, that would be in the bottom here? Yeah, I would say that like if I set, um, you know, if up top here, I set the goal, if my goal was again that 5,000, and uh, I actually walked, um, you know, 5,500, then normally I think of this gap as being a positive quantity encouraging me to walk more. But now I see that my gap is a negative quantity, minus 500. Now, um, so the, the drifting goals interpretation, um, what you could say that, well, I'm either going to, you could, if your goal stayed the same, this is not the drifting goals interpretation, but if the goal stayed the same, then you might the next day just walk less. And that you would be regulating down to your goal. The positive interpretation from drifting goals would be that because you got a negative gap here, then instead of walking less, you should increase your goal the next day to 5,500 or 6,000. And so now your goal keeps moving away. The downside of having that, uh, that, uh, that, that mental, that um, I guess that pathos, whatever, uh, the downside of, of thinking that way is that if you do find that uh, over time your gap goes from being negative, which is a good thing, to positive is a bad thing, then you might end up causing your goal to come back down. So the big, what the big thing to identify is in drifting goals, when, if you ever notice that your goal is mutable, it is changeable, it is something that the system can alter, you might have done that for a good reason, to, uh, to drive yourself to do more. But the, the, the downside of that is that by allowing your goal to be internally set, you might accidentally cause yourself to have an attitude that lowers that goal over time. So if you're not meeting the goal, you just reduce the goal. And so that's the risk whenever you notice, notice that you have a goal set inside the system versus outside the system. That's um, one of the things that like if, you know, if Google Fit or Apple helped, if, if it says, oh, I noticed that you haven't been walking enough or you've been walking way more. How about we set this higher? Um, you know, that's sort of, because you're not directly controlling it, that they're sort of suggesting you walk more. The thought is that you have an actual, that you should make you actually walk more. Whereas if you're setting the goal for yourself, then you're very liable to not kind of be ambitious enough. So that's drifting goals. The characteristic is the goal is inside the system. And so they, as bullet, goals located outside the system are less susceptible to drift. All right, any other questions about this distinction? All right. So those are our four ways that I want you to know that you can use these system level archetypes. I'm not asking you to memorize all of the archetypes. If I was to ask you about any of these archetypes on a midterm or something like that, I would probably give you these complex archetypes, except for those four that are out of the Moorcroft book or six or whatever, which basically come down to different ways of reshuffling um, uh, reinforcing plus balancing plus delay, or basically all six of those. But these like really complicated ones, I would give you those, but then I might ask you questions about them. But I do want you to sort of think of these four different ways that you could make use of them, being looking for loops, so identifying these structural pattern templates, going from um, individual variables to links, which are <coughs> defensible ways variables get around, uh, uh, connect to each other, and then all the way to loops, where you forget about the variables and you just look for these feedbacks. A lens, so identifying the right questions. So you can say, if I were to look at this system as if it were a tragedy of the commons, what would be the components here? And what do I know about tragedy of the commons to help me solve this problem? A dynamic theory, if you see a funny behavior over time, you say, I don't understand why they keep doing this then this provides you an archetype to say, well, I know that here's an archetype where people keep doing one thing, even though you've provided them another thing. Can we then use that archetype to suggest interventions for us to use in the real system? And then a tool for predicting behavior. Given that I know what my system looks like, can I trust historical data? Or what are the different scenarios that could happen in the future if we just keep going this way? So we take all of those and we design interventions. That's our goal. 
as, in, in sustainability practice. We map out an intervention, um, and then we can do things in these archetypes. Like we can break a link, we can add a link, we, we can shorten a delay. So we come up, we look at the archetypes, and then we map out interventions. We say, we need to find a way to implement this link or get rid of this link. Then we predict what's going to happen. So if we got rid of this link or added this link, we predict that this good thing will happen in the system. And then the important thing is that we then have to do controlled experiments. So we have to go out in the real world, hopefully, and, inter and actually intervene, or as a stepping stone to that, what we learned to do in this class is use computer simulation. Can I build a sim that before the intervention acts like the real world system and allows me to test the intervention on it. And then from that sim, so this is basically hypothesis, this is prediction, and this is test by experiment. So this is going back to this hypothesis that was already set up for me before I got in here. And, uh, and this iterative process is effectively the scientific process. But we're doing this with you know, usually social systems where there is no underlying theory. There's no physics. There's no chemistry that we can lean on. And so that's why we have to do these empirical studies to build up knowledge. And we might find that our intervention didn't work in the sim. If it didn't work, then we go back up and we say, all right, let's get rid of that intervention and, and come up with a different intervention. Or maybe we need to add to our intervention. So that's the process that we're building up to here. So we've talked the causal loop diagrams that we've been talking about are up here. And it, we're at the end of unit C. When we start unit D next week, we're starting into stock and flow diagrams, which allow us to do the computer sims and then ultimately close this loop. So that's where we're going. So any questions about how all this these archetypes fit into the process or any of the archetypes? assignments that uh, we give on Sunday. All right, so looking forward, um, there uh, I would say start reading chapter three, but it's gonna be a while till it comes up. So next week will be uh, uh, lectures D1 and D2. The week after that would be lectures D3 and D4. That lecture D4 will be the lecture that goes over chapter three. Um, so we are going to start building stock and flow diagrams. We can do that inside Vincent. But I'm asking you to also make a free Insight Maker account. This is a web-based stock and flow diagram <laughs> simulation tool, system dynamics modeling sim simulation tool. We will start seeing a little bit of arithmetic in the next section. That's how we're going to implement these stock and flow diagrams. After lecture D4, we'll go into the midterm. So there are some practice problems and solutions on Canvas. There is a review session that we will do before the, the midterm. And then after the midterm, we have this retake exam, which is basically going to be an equal length midterm, equal number of questions, equal difficulty of questions, but different questions. And I just take the highest score off the two of those. So, um, so I think the midterm is like on a Thursday, the retake will be on a Tuesday, and then lecture E1 will be the Thursday before spring break, and then spring break happens. Uh, that's all the question for you. Yeah, that's the goal. Excellent question. Right, so the goal here, since it's all going to be Scantron, is you'll turn these things into me. I get them at 4.15. I drop them off at the library, and uh, if they're not back, the backlog, usually within 24 to 48 hours, they give me the scores back. And I'll post the scores, and I'll post solutions in between. So that's the thought, is that then you'll be able to see. So let's say you wanted to skip the whole last week of class before spring break. Um, and you were okay with missing lecture E1 because uh, it'll be recorded and everything like that, you can get your scores back, you can do the calculus in your head, and you can just not come to my class. That's fine. I don't judge you. So, um, but that's the goal. Was there any other questions about that or anything moving forward? All right, and then there's a muddiest point as usual. Um, even though I don't get a chance to respond to all of these, I do um, I look through them and sort of see where everybody's having trouble, so I really appreciate your efforts on that. And uh, so let's close out class today. So the attendance exercise is um, finish the sentence from, we go from single variables to single loops to patterns of blank. So what we go from single blank, single variables to single loops to patterns of whatever that word should be. <laughs>